Welcome everyone joining us on Zoom or on YouTube to the next iteration of the Climate Change AI webinar series and our first for 2022. Um, this webinar is on machine learning for biodiversity monitoring and we are very excited to have with us Sarah Vieri and Dave Thau. Um, before I introduce our speakers, let me introduce Climate Change AI briefly. Uh, the organization running this webinar series. Uh, my name is David Rolnick, and I'm one of the chairs of Climate Change AI and an assistant professor of computer science at McGill University in Mila. Climate Change AI is a global initiative to catalyze impactful work at the intersection of climate change and AI via a global network of researchers, policymakers, entrepreneurs, and other stakeholders, digital resources for working in this space, advice for stakeholders, and events for knowledge sharing. We run a host of different initiatives. Um, you may be aware of our big report on tackling climate change with machine learning, um, which identifies key opportunities for machine learning and AI and helping tackle, tackle climate change in many different sectors, uh, mitigation, adaptation, and climate science. If you don't want to uh, wrangle the entire 100 page report, we also have interactive summaries, which you can search by area of application or by area of machine learning at climatechange.ai slash summaries. We run events um, at the uh, conferences, ICML, NIRIPS, iClear, et cetera, and at the UN Climate Change Conference, the COP. Um, video recordings of our events are in general available at climatechange.ai slash events. You can also search through accepted papers, which I think are three or 400 now, um, by again, a machine learning technique or subject area at climatechange.ai slash papers, question mark. Um, some new initiatives which we've recently launched. Um, um, you can connect with the overall CCI community via community.climatechange.ai, ask questions, um, find out what people are talking about at the intersection of machine learning and different areas relevant to, to climate change. We also have a directory, uh, which again, just started. So help us fill it out with more people, join the directory or check out what, what people are already there, putting down areas of experience, what you're looking for, what you're offering. For example, if you're looking for a particular kind of, of job, that could be a good place to put it down. Um, that's directory.climatechange.ai. Um, and then something else that we recently launched is the Climate Change AI blog. So check out the posts there. Um, at climatechange.ai slash blog. Uh, we also have a wiki, which is a community driven um, repository of knowledge on um, what um, resources one should be aware of in different areas related to climate change and AI. One can think of this as a living repository that changes unlike our tackling climate with change with machine learning paper, which represented one snapshot of the field. This is something which everyone can help keep up to date. We also have happy hours webinars, which you already know about because you're in this one. Well done. Um, happy hours happen every two weeks, and you can sign up for those at the website as well. And uh, I apologize. Um, I accidentally um, accidentally clicked on the, um, the website instead of going to the next slide. My apologies on that. Um, one moment. It wouldn't be a virtual presentation without some kind of technical difficulties. Um, and finally, the CCI newsletter. If you're interested in keeping up to date on uh, calls for submissions, funding, projects, readings, and jobs, and other things in the space of climate change and AI, sign up for our newsletter. And there will also be making announcements about a bunch of those other things that I talked about. So if you want to sign up for one thing, this is probably the thing to sign up for because it will remind you about all the other things. Um, with that, I will hand it over to our first speaker and introduce our speakers for the day. Um, our first speaker is Dave Thau. Um, and if you'd like to start sharing your screen, you should hopefully be able to, to do that. Um, uh, Dave is um, Global Data and Technology Lead Scientist at the World Wildlife Fund, WWF. 
Uh, before joining the WWF in 2019, he worked at Google, where he helped launch Google Earth Engine, which is Google's geospatial big data processing platform, and managed developer relations for Google Earth Engine and Google Earth Outreach. He's also worked with the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, GBIF, the California Academy of Sciences, Kansas University Museum of Natural History, and the All Species Foundation. Dave's work in the fields of data management, sustainability, AI, and remote sensing has appeared in journals like Science, Nature, Remote Sensing of the Environment, uh, sustainability and ecological informatics. While at Google, he helped develop many projects, including Global Forest Watch with the World Resources Institute and Map of Life with researchers from Yale and the University of Florida. Thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thanks uh, for the introduction, David, and thank you all for being here. Um, I'm glad to be here too. I'm going to talk about um, machine learning for biodiversity and also for ecology or sort of habitats, which is like a surrogate for monitoring biodiversity. Um, so let's see. Here we go. So we're in this period, so a lot of people are calling it Anthropocene, where humans are having a big impact on the entire planet. Um, and there are three big aspects to that. Um, climate change, biodiversity loss, and food insecurity. Um, climate change, I don't think I need to tell this crowd about it. You know, the planet's getting warmer, and we're a big reason for that. Uh, the, um, in terms of food, uh, where there are projections on how much food we'll need uh, moving forward, which is uh, the green line and how much food we're producing the orange and red line. So there's going to be a greater need for um, food, which is having a, which will have an impact on biodiversity. And biodiversity itself um, is, is uh, being challenged. Um, this is uh, data from um, the IUCN Red List uh, since 2007, showing the number of species that are endangered. Um, and it's steadily rising. You know, if you look at the bottom set as mammals, so the, you know, big animals that we focus on often, those are the, a smaller percentage of the species on the planet and their, you know, rate of extinction is growing proportionally. But overall, if you look at all species, um, you know, it's been going down in, in IPBES, um, which is the intergovernmental panel on biodiversity and ecosystem services zooms out a little bit in time and pr uh, provided us sort of from 1500 on, you can see the, um, the rate of extinctions. So biodiversity is definitely, um, no matter how you measure it on decline in terms of population, species, whatever, right? Uh, so one of the things, major thing WWF is working on is trying to um, stem that decline and go from one where biodiversity is declining to one where um, it's stable or improving. And I'm gonna tell you about how we and others are using machine learning to do that. Um, one good way to look at uh, all of these challenges through, is through the UN sustainability goals, the SDGs. Um, and of the SDGs, there are 17 of them and uh, life, on land and life below water are uh, two of those. If um, McKinsey did a big review of AI applications and life on land is um, kind of, it's one of the mo largest ones that they found. Uh, it's towards the bottom. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Life below water, not so much. So there's a lot of work that we could be uh, doing there, but there are a lot of applications currently of AI um, addressing the, um, challenges that we have uh, for biodiversity, well, largely on land. There's another really good report, um, oops, um, uh, I, from Nature Communications on different applications of AI and, and how they're applying to uh, these various SDGs. Um, so, you know, these ones up here in the environment in the um, upper left, um, there are lots of applications. Um, and uh, they also did a really nice study of the kind of the negative impacts that those uh, AI applications might have. And they're pretty low for the biodiversity side of things. Um, so if you're looking for a good set of current work uh, of AI on these challenges, those are two good um, resources. And recently, um, 
at Wild Labs, um, Speaker at Al published a nice study looking at the tools that people are currently using to do conservation um, and what the conservation experts think will be the most important ones moving forward. Um, so you know, on the left-hand side of this graph, you see what people are currently using and on the right hand side, what they think is gonna be most powerful. And number one is machine learning and computer vision. Um, I'm not gonna be talking so much about computer vision, but Sarah who's speaking next is all about computer vision and we'll give you a lot of details on that. Um, so if you're looking for promising new areas, well, you're there in machine learning for conservation. All right, so now I'll give you some examples of stuff that I've worked on that's relevant um, and some future things that I think are gonna be interesting. Uh, first is on the remote sensing side. Um, David mentioned work that I had done um, at Google with Earth Engine, so I'll tell you a little bit about Earth Engine. Um, one thing to point out is we have been using machine learning for remote sensing uh, almost since there have been satellites. Um, this, is, this is work that was done in the 70s, early 70s, using um, uh, regression trees. Uh, to do land cover classification on the first set of uh, Landsat satellites. Um, you know, we're up to Landsat 9. Um, it's great to see this old work and they've got, they even have like a screen, a touch screen to classify the land cover. Um, this is work out of Purdue. So we've been using machine learning for, for a long time and it's just been getting better and better as the data get better and better and we learn new techniques. Also, the data avail availability has just massively increased, right? So this is this is the Landsat data catalog. So it's, it's, it's been Landsat satellites been collecting data since the early '70s. Um, around, but the data were not available widely. You had to pay for it until about 2008, um, when Congress made the great decision to make the catalog available publicly. You can see here, as soon as that happened, people started eating up the data, um, and you know. Now, you know, Earth Engine launched in 2010. Since then, the amount of remote sensing data that's available is just exploded. Um, so Earth Engine was created to help people analyze the data. Even though it's available, it wasn't very easy to use um, and access. And especially for like machine learning applications, uh, it was a lot of data management people had to do. And so Earth Engine was built to make that easier. You can go to Earth Engine there. It's uh, free for um, non-commercial use. Uh, it has a big catalog of data, constantly getting more data in. It's like petabytes of remotely sensed data and other kinds of data. And it's all sitting on lots of computers there in the Google Cloud. Uh, the data are near the machines or on the machines that are doing the analysis. Uh, and you have access to unknown number of computers and all the parallelization that occurs happens behind the scenes. So you don't even know, which is nice. There's a integrated development environment uh, which supports JavaScript and you can use Python if you wanna put it into your um, you know, pipelines. And it's been used for lots of stuff. So I'll talk about one of the first major works, which was uh, a for global, which is a study on forest loss. So lots of species are in forests. Well, monitoring forests is a great way to monitor um, biodiversity in general. And um, the Matt Hansen and his group that's now at UMD uh, have since 2012 produced an annual map of forest loss. Uh, and their current uh, 2020 was the last one out. They're gonna come out with 2021 pretty soon. Um, this uses uh, CART um, decision trees uh, to figure out where forest loss is occurring. Um, it's a global data set, 30 meter data, uh, and it is one of the most stable long-term environmentally focused data sets that are that that's available. This one thing that's nice is these data have been moved into this thing called Global Forest Watch, which was created and convened by the World Resource Institute, which makes the data available. So one of the, you know, there are lots of works using machine learning to identify um, habitats. Um, and nonprofit organizations are a great way to get that information out and um, usable by like non-experts and non-scientists. Global Forest Watch is focused on forest data. And through Global Forest Watch, 
and its aggregation of other data, um, governments and um, reporters have been able and have been able to use the data to have impact. So, you know, the uh, government of the Philippines used Global Forest Watch to um, create new bill prohibiting discretion of mangroves. Indonesia is building a GFW into their sort of situation room. Lots of examples of using uh, the machine learning data in Global Forest Watch. Um, another great example of using machine learning uh, for um, biodiversity monitoring is a system called Global Fishing Watch. Uh, so this is another project that came out of Google and it's now its own thing. Um, they use machine learning to identify where people are fishing and whether they're fishing places they shouldn't be because overfishing is a huge cause of uh, damage to the biodiversity in the ocean. Um, what you see here are uh, thousands of ships that uh, all ships above a certain size need to uh, every, I think it's 15 seconds, say where they are. Initially, it was to stop them from avoiding, um, from, from crashing into each other. Um, but now, but they continue to be uh, using these signals for whatever. Um, and Global Fishing Watch is using it to, to track the vessels to see if they're fishing in places that are protected. And they use machine learning to do that. Um, question is, if you're tracking a vessel, is it fishing or not? And is it fishing in a place where it shouldn't be or not? Uh, and machine learning is used to determine um, the kind of vessel it is, because some vessels are not fishing vessels and others are. And then if it is a fishing vessel, um, machine learning is used to see whether it's engaging in uh, fishing behavior or, or not, right? And it's using um, convolutional neural networks, both for the identification of the kind of vessel it is, um, uh, and also for whether or not it's, uh, it's engaging in fishing behaviors. So this is a great application and is using um, convolutional neural networks. Um, a, a project that I'm working on with uh, WWF Netherlands is a prediction system. So this is trying to uh, predict where forest loss is gonna happen um, based on a number of different factors. And the idea is, um, you know, we can see from the, the Hansen data at an annual rate um, where it's happened, but can we get in there? Can we predict so that we can move resources to help uh, fight it before it really happens at a large scale? Um, so this is called Forest Foresight, and it's an early warning system for prediction. Uh, it uses um, XGBoost, uh, to figure out where to help make its predictions based on a number of factors. And one thing that's nice about the system is there's a big integration of uh, the predictions with the actual like going into the field and investigating the causes of it and the prioritization of the predictions. Um, so it's being piloted now in a number of places um, in Indonesia, Gabon, um, and a um, uh, few other places, Sabatra. Um, you can see where there are potential hotspots um, and uh, you can go in and say, okay, you've investigated it and here's what's happening and you can continue to investigate. And here are some of the features that go in. It's like where there was previous forest loss, uh, where there are communities, um, elevation, distance to roads, things like that. All of that goes into the XGBoost algorithm to derive the predictions, um, which uh, are already proving to be useful for many of the people who are uh, trying to stave deforestation off. Okay. Um, another project I'll mention, which is using machine learning, is um, this project uh, currently in Colombia to help drive finance uh, to sustainable uh, projects. So there are uh, lots of sustainability minded projects um, that are looking at trying to boost economies in a way that preserves biodiversity. And a challenge is getting funding to those, those projects. There's, there's a lot of money that's being um, allocated to support sustainability projects, um, but there's a challenge getting that funding to where it ought to be. Uh, so this project, 
um, which is also in this sort of development stage, uh, as I'm giving you a preview, is meant to help uh, investors and other funders find sustainability projects, um, initially in the Colombian Amazon with the idea that it'll be uh, throughout all the Amazonian countries if it turns out to be successful. Um, and the machine learning here comes uh, in because we're trying to uh, help identify what kind of positive impacts the projects can have. Right, so there are lots, lots of sites that have projects that can be funded, um, but they're, they don't provide tools for really measuring potential impacts. And that's the idea with this project. Uh, so the idea is that um, people who have projects that are looking for funding can upload them. And then the system uses lots of data sources, remotely sensed data, uh, on the ground collected data, um, financial data uh, to, um, to measure how impactful the project may be on four axes, which is uh, biodiversity, um, the strengthening the community, uh, hydrology, um, and also climate slash carbon. Uh, and um, using machine learning, we'll be able to estimate these things and give investors an idea if they're focusing on, if you want to focus on biodiversity focused project, which of those projects will it be? Um, and also tracking over time, like for a given project where it is, uh, how the situation on the ground is changing for those projects over time. Uh, to do the machine learning for this project, um, we're working with the Basque Center for Climate Change. They have a system called ARIES, um, Artificial Intelligence for Environment and Sustainability. Uh, and they're the folks that we're relying on to do the AI to help do these predictions. Uh, this system is already being used by the United Nations to um, measure uh, ecosystem services. It's an ecosystem accounting system. So, you know, water quality, pollination, thing, things like that. These are ecosystem services. So it's currently rolled out in this um, SIA UN site, if you want to play with it. Um, the idea with Aries is you start with a question, like you want to know, okay, what's, you know, how's how are the pollinators in this area doing? And they have access to lots of data sets and lots of models. Uh, and they've um, used semantic annotations uh, to, you know, represent what the models inputs can be, what the data sets include, where they're happening. And then based on your question and the location, it goes, finds it, looks at its data sets, looks at its models, and builds a workflow to answer the question. So the, the AI here is some of the symbolic kind of AI, um, you know, that's behind semantic web and sort of old school, you know, good old AI. Uh, and also they use machine learning um, to help build the models. And we're going to be using the machine learning to help um, model, you know, the impacts um, given the data sets that they have. Uh, so from the models, you know, then it, report, it comes up with reports like tables, maps, and also one thing that's super cool about um, this platform is documentation. So for all the data sets and all the models that go into the workflow, they have a huge document saying exactly what went in. So for an investor who's looking for a project, who's asking a question and wants to know, well, you know, what's the potential impact of this project? It's gonna come with lots of documentation which is great. All right. So here's some things moving forward, uh, some things that are pretty interesting and also some challenges. First thing that's happening is, uh, you know, the cadence of data coming in is increasing. So I talked about the Hansen annual data. Now there's a new system that he has called GLAD. Um, actually there's a newer one called RAD, which uses radar, which is like weekly reporting. So the rate that data are coming in is just vastly increasing. Um, and that's, that's nice. And also the resolution and the types of data. So there's, you know, the, the, the project, the problems are just getting uh, more challenging and interesting and the data are getting richer and faster, which is nice. Uh, one place where, uh, to on the, that needs support and is getting better is just straight up engineering pipelines, right? Like, we're good as academics to, in producing models and algorithms and methods to measure various things. But when you get down to like regular distribution of consistent data over time, um, that's something that's 
in the works, right? I mean, it's getting better and better. We're getting better at it, but just this basic engineering pipeline work in the field is something that still, there's a lot of room for improvement on. I'm just giving this airflow example as an example of the kind of sort of technology that's being used in other areas that's now being starting to be used in sort of biodiversity you know, ecosystem monitoring. And there's work to, work to be done there. Here, so here are some of the challenges in, in particular relative to work that's happening in climate. Um, so for biodiversity, there, there are lots of uh, factors that make it extra challenging. One is um, you're talking about land and whenever you're talking about land, there are people on that land and you know, there are people uh, who've been uh, in specific places for thousands and thousands of years, right? And when you're talking about trying to preserve biodiversity in various areas, you have to consider the people who are living there, right? And so anything you do in conservation, you need to, to take, you know, you need to be working with those communities. And, you, and so there are lots of data sources like poverty data, resilience data, lots of social metrics, um, which are critical and getting those data in a scalable way is, is challenging. And especially if you talk about data sovereignty, uh, which is like who owns the data, who has the right to share the data. Very, very complicated when you're talking about preserving biodiversity, uh, you know, globally. Um, the indicators are less clear than they are in climate. In climate, you know, you can measure CO2, you can measure greenhouse gases, temperature, right? In biodiversity you know, ecosystem services, well, we can, you can look at like population size or number of species, um, but you know things like ecosystem services, there are lots of different possible indicators you could be using. So there's a little bit less clarity there. And the primary indicator, like critters and plants, is very hard to scale. So Sarah is going to be talking a lot about some of that. Um, but if you look at like the remote sensing data, you can scale that. But if you're trying to figure out how many pangolins are here, that's harder. Um, one open question for all this stuff is, you know, a lot of a lot of the work that we've been doing and comparisons of models, some of the old models work great. CART works great, um, you know, standard regression works great. Sometimes convolutional neural networks and other deep learning models uh, work better, but we don't really understand when and why. So getting a better understanding of that is good. And just measuring impacts is uh, a, a huge challenge. Like knowing when an intervention actually has an impact and what that impact is major challenge for biodiversity and ecosystem services. Um, and here's, a, I'll end with some promising areas. Um, so one is environmental DNA. The ability to collect information about species in a vast area um, using DNA is getting really exciting. And initially it was like measuring DNA in water, but now there are projects using drones to collect air samples and measure the DNA in air samples to figure out what species are there. Very exciting stuff. Bioacoustics, there's a lot of work going on there. Um, it continues using sound to figure out uh, environmental health and also identify specific species. Combining all of these things is a novel area um, that, that's getting a lot of work, um, both on the systems level, like how do you get all these things to work together? And then how do you analyze all the data in a combined way? Um, very, very exciting. Using autonomous systems, to do the data collection. Um, so there's a thing called the XPRIZE and there's a rainforest specific one, um, XPRIZE Rainforest. And that's the main thing there is like, can you create an autonomous system to identify species in a given area quickly? Um, so that's fun and exciting. And then finally, um, participatory monitoring, using people who are in the areas to, or having people who are in the areas use the tools that are available to do the collection to support their needs um, is, is growing, the capacity building is happening and making the tools easier to use um, is critical for that. So I'll end there. Thanks um, very much. I look forward to all of your questions. Thank you so much, Dave, for that fantastic talk. There are a lot of questions already building up in the chat. We're gonna have save all the questions until a, a Q&A block at the end for, for both speakers. So um, now we'll have our second speaker. We're really delighted to have Sarah Beery here, um, final year PhD candidate in computing and mathematical sciences at Caltech, advised by Pietro Perona. Her research focuses on building computer vision methods that enable efficient, accessible, and equitable global scale biodiversity monitoring. 
She's a recipient of a PIMCO Data Science Fellowship, Amazon AI for Science Fellowship, and NSF Graduate Research Fellowship. Sarah founded the AI for Conservation Slack community and is the founding director of the Caltech Summer School on Computer Vision Methods for Ecology. She works closely with Microsoft AI for Earth, Google Research, and Wildlife Insights, where she turns her research into usable tools for the ecological community. And Sarah is also a former professional ballerina, fun fact. Um, I will turn it over to you now. Really excited for your talk. And again, please drop questions in the Slack for uh, either Sarah or Dave, and we'll get to them after the talk. Awesome. Thank you for that introduction, David, and for calling me out on my ballet past. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so Dave, Dave, that was a really, really great overview. And actually, some of those projects are ones I hadn't seen before, so it's like now I have exciting stuff to go look into. Um, I'm going to be digging in a little bit more on this computer vision or general machine learning side and, and looking at some of the ways that existing methods tend to fail and ways that myself and other researchers are trying to, to fix it, basically. Um, so, you know, Dave did a great example of motivating. So at this point, I don't know that we really need this, but biodiversity is in global decline. Um, you know, if you, depending on who you talk to, they'll tell you that uh, we're currently losing species at a faster rate than the extinction of the dinosaurs. So just for a little bit of scope. <laughs> um, and Dave touched on this as well, but one of the things that's really exciting is that um, though people have been collecting data to try to monitor biodiversity for hundreds of years, the variety, the breadth, and the diversity and the scale of the data that have, we've started to collect recently, um, just with these advances in sensor technology are really changing the game in terms of what we think may be possible for biodiversity monitoring. This is everything from satellite data, drones, on animal tracking, um, stationary sensors like camera traps, which are fixed static cameras placed in networks to um, monitor an area in, in very high resolution. Um, Bioacoustic sensors, similarly, we also actually work with sonar. Um, and then like Dave mentioned, community science, networks of passionate community members who are going out and collecting scientific data in their, in their local area. Um, and what we run into is when you're collecting data at this scale, the traditional way that you might think about trying to build, for example, a species distribution model, would you be go out, you'd collect a bunch of data, and then if it's that from camera trap, for example, you would then go through all of your camera trap data and label each individual image with which species were seen in that image, maybe how many species of that, of that type. Um, these days we collect a lot more data than makes that feasible. I put out a network of camera traps in Kenya um, back in 2020 and uh, that project collected 10 million images last year. So I am not going to be manually labeling all of those images to species. Community scientists have collected over 64 million species observations in iNaturalist. These are pictures of plants and animals and bugs that people have taken on their phones and uploaded to a common data repository. Um, and a single aerial survey, one flight of a low-flying aircraft that's trying to do an animal population census, look at you know, how many elephants are there in this area, can generate over 200 terabytes of video. So the traditional approach of labeling the data first before you do analysis um, needs to be automated. And this is where computer vision and machine learning can really play in a very obvious role, right? How, how do we process this automatically? Um, now, of course, because you know this is the real world, it comes with real world challenges. So um, the first is biodiversity data is noisy. We're not talking about ImageNet where there's a human photographer who's really pointing the camera and focusing it and centering it on the thing that you need to identify. Um, we see stuff with heavy levels of occlusion, um, low data quality from weather, from lighting. And also um, a lot of what is currently termed empty data um, if you're a wildlife ecologist, any false trigger of your camera trap is a picture of no animals at all. It's one that you need to sort through. And sometimes this is 70% of your data. But I like to think of this as an opportunity because potentially what that's giving you, um, if you have the ability to automate the processing, is a longitudinal study of a local ecosystem at a fine-grained level. Um, but currently we just don't have the ability to extract information about the plants and you know, the, the habitat 
um, in an automated way. Um, biodiversity data has a very long tail. Um, there are common species that represent just a few examples. Um, and then there are many, many, many more species that are rare. And from a scientific perspective, a rare species may be endangered and a sighting of a rare species might be much more important to categorize correctly than maybe your 2000th image of a mule deer. Um, and so what this is showing actually is, you know, if you estimate you need around 100 examples of species to be able to get a computer vision method to recognize that species off the shelf. In iNaturalist, you know, this was an older figure. So at the time, there was around 10,000 species in iNaturalist that crossed that threshold of enough um, and another order of magnitude more species that did not. So uh, to make this work really at scale across the entire taxonomic tree, we cannot ignore the low shot learning problem. Um, and then maybe most insidiously, biodiversity data is not IID. So when you talk about the fundamental assumptions in machine learning that your train and your test are independently and identically distributed, this is just not true. Um, you are never going to be able to collect a data set that covers the entire globe at a level of representation that covers the whole taxonomic tree, including changes over time. And what we see is that um, if you're looking here on the left, it's a map of global biodiversity. So this is alpha diversity, which measures how many unique species exist in a certain place. A lot of our biodiversity is living in the sub equatorial tropics. Um, but if you look at the data that we've collected as a scientific community, where that data is located and where it's been, you know, this is a repository called the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Um, most of the data we have is not actually from the places where we have the largest amounts of biodiversity. Um, and then beyond that, each individual species has its own unique distribution that correlates to access to livable habitat. And as habitat is changing and climate change happens, um, our species distributions are also changing. So we can't ignore the distribution shift problem either. Um, and so the first thing I'm going to talk about is, you know, how do we measure this distribution shift and its effect on our performance and are there ways that we can overcome it? Um, so we're, we're going to start by looking at uh, static cameras, those camera traps I talked about before. Um, these are examples of the 22 million camera trap records that exist in Wildlife Insights. This is a project that actually Dave and I both work on in different capacities. Um, and this project is seeking to try to automate this process of labeling species and camera trap data at a global scale, building machine learning models in the back end and data processing pipelines in the front end that allow people to, to massively scale up their ability to monitor wildlife on the ground. Um, and so if we're looking at static cameras, one of the things that's quite interesting is um, each camera, not, you know, based on where they're placed generally, but each unique camera ends up having a distinctive background. So, cause it's a fixed background. So you have a lot of repetition, but it also has a distinctive class distribution that is related to the underlying species distributions, but actually is also related to the individual habits of the animals that live near that camera. So you might have a bobcat, for example, that lives near your camera trap. And then you see 90% bobcats, even though bobcats are incredibly rare in the area overall. Um, so actually, it's a per sensor distribution. Um, and this, uh, like these combination of this fixed background, the limited um, variability of the perspective seen on the species and these distribution shifts means that models trained on a set of static camera traps tend to not generalize well to new camera traps placed in the wild, which is a significant problem if you want to build something like Wildlife Insights that will work. Um, and so this type of distribution shift and also the corresponding drop off in performance is not unique to biodiversity data. Um, and so I worked with a bunch of other researchers to build a benchmark that captures this type of realistic real world distribution shift across different domains so that we can actually start to study this in reality as opposed to sort of trying to fake distribution shifts within data that we already have and try to understand how to tackle them in that way. And one of the things that I think is most elucidating about this benchmark and looking at the, the leaderboards for it is that no one method rules them all, right? Some methods are good at some types of distribution shifts, some methods are good at others, but nothing is really solving this problem across the board. Um, and so, you know, how do we think about trying to close this gap when you have static sensors, which is a specific type of problem? 
Um, so one thing that, you know, is it seems kind of trivial, but what we found by, by really taking this um, strategic approach to understanding and evaluating our methods as they're intended to be used, you know, forcing us to evaluate methods on new sensors, even though it's hard, um, is that we found that while species categorization does not generalize well, if you just find the class agnostic animal category, um, that generalizes surprisingly well. And we knew that there was a need, even just for the ability to localize um, data that had things of interest in it and localize the animals within that. So I worked with uh, Dan Morris at Microsoft AI for Earth a few years ago, and um, we worked to curate a data set that would allow us to train this class agnostic detector in a way that would be usable off the shelf for different people using camera trap data. Something that generalizes well means it can be impactful. Um, and so, you know, currently this is being used um, by over 40 NGOs worldwide, conservation organizations. Um, we processed over 100 million images last year, and, and that number is only going up. Um, and so, two examples of ways that people use this model in their biodiversity monitoring pipelines is like the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. They now only have to manually label around 15% of their data because they're able to filter out all of the empties. Um, and, uh, and that this means they actually are able to process the data within the year it's collected, which they were never able to do before. So that means now when they're making science policy decisions, they can evaluate them quickly as opposed to evaluating a policy decision after five years, in which case you can actually cause a lot of damage. Um, another example is with Wildlife Protection Solutions, which is a nonprofit that has edge-based cameras, so they connect cameras to the cloud in the edge. They're sending model images to the cloud and detecting um, poaching threats by finding vehicles or humans from our model that are in protected areas where they're not intended to be. And they estimate they detect around one real wildlife threat per week on average. Um, so this is a nice example of um, maybe I'm not solving anyone's problem all the way, but if you use machine learning effectively and evaluate it well, you can find where it actually can be useful now. Um, and it already can be useful now in a lot of scenarios. Um, and then, you know, ways that we can try to adapt, try to actually get the species categorization to work for new projects. Um, you know, one thing we've looked at is, is can we take um, methods from active learning and use something about the underlying structure of the static cameras and these fixed sensors um, and the fact that we are good at detecting animals. Um, and we found that uh, we can reduce the amount of labels necessary to get the same sort of supervised machine learning accuracy um, by like 99.5% using active learning approaches. Um, another thing that you can try to do to improve this, you know, distribution shift problem is you can actually try to model the distribution. So this is work from Oshin McKay and um, Elijah Cole in my lab at Caltech. And what they do is they model the probability of a class given an image from the image, so that's a classic, you know, computer vision um, method. And then they also model for a given location, a spatiotemporal prior over the likely species that you might see. And then they're combining that to basically give you the probability of a species given an image and a location. Um, and they were able to see an improvement around 10% on predicting images from species of images in iNaturalist. Um, and Oshin also, with one of his recent PhD students, um, has been looking at self-supervised learning as a way to, to actually adapt well to some of these, these scenarios. And what they're doing is they're taking the underlying structure, the, the known fact that you have these fixed cameras, and they're using common context to help them build more diverse pairs for um, contrastive learning algorithms. Um, okay, so now I'll talk a little bit about learning from imperfect data. You know, how do we handle things like the grubby zebra and the fog in this image? Um, so I said rare classes are hard. Uh, one thing that we have looked into is um, can we use existing graphics engines and things like generative adversarial networks to make fake <laughs> images of rare species that allow us to perform better? And the answer is yes. Um, the bottleneck here is actually generating the 3D models of each type of species, but there's work coming out of Angju Kanazawa and Michael Black's lab that's looking at automating that as well. So potentially one way we can tackle the low shot is um, by synthesizing data of endangered species we really care about to ensure that we don't uh, 
miss them. <laughs> um, and then, you know, as an example of some work that I did recently, but if you have an image like this, there's just no way, like no, nobody, nobody can tell you whether that's an animal or not with just an image alone. Um, but experts are not, when they're labeling this data, looking at just one image at a time. They're looking at many images and they're not just looking at, you know, oh, within some sort of small window, they're actually learning over time as they label data for one fixed sensor, what types of species are showing up and, and something about how those species look for that specific sensor. Um, and so they're relying on things like a month of contextual information to help them label images that would be impossible otherwise, because if you just look in a short time window, everything is foggy, there's nothing you can do. Um, and so what we did is we um, used an attention-based two-stage approach to try to build a representation of a sensor um, and then use that representation to in integrate that long-term context into object detection. Um, and uh, this type of thing using attention, it's, you know, it's nice, it's adaptive to relevance. There's no heuristic built in. Your model gets to decide what's important. Um, and what we found is that it improves on these challenging cases, right? It helps us with things with poor lighting where the animal's moving in and out of the frame. Um, and we're currently looking at deploying that within Wildlife Insights to try to help at a larger scale. And then the last thing I'm gonna talk about is this last mile part of this puzzle. Um, say you build a method and you've evaluated it and you're proud of it. How do you actually deploy that in the real world in a way that's impactful? What does it mean to deploy an efficient human AI system? Um, so one example of this is a project that I've been managing um, and, and managing a bunch of really amazing students on that uh, called Elephant Book. Um, it's a joint project between the Allen AI Institute, Wild Me, and the Mara Elephant Project and Caltech. And what we've done is we've built a system that's allowing us um, to visually monitor the elephant population in the Mara. And we're doing that by recognizing individual elephants and in images. Um, and the cool thing here is we started from no data. <laughs> we started by building a system that allowed um, our local team to collect data while they were able to start building up their database. And then as we started to get enough data to train computer vision models, now we're able to actually use, rely more and more on the computer vision, which is important because as actually the database is scaling, it becomes a harder and harder problem for the humans. Um, so it's a really nice example of how you can trade off between human intelligence and artificial intelligence to get results at a scale that wasn't possible before. Um, we're also looking at multi-object tracking. One version of that is counting salmonid escapement in sonar data for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and NOAA. And here we're trying to basically uh, measure um, how many salmon are escaping upriver so that you can ensure that before you open the fishery, you've actually got enough salmon that are going to spawn to maintain the sustainability of that fishing industry in a few years. Three years usually is like the life cycle of a salmon. Um, we're also looking at efficiently answering novel ecological questions. So Say you have all of the 64 million observations in iNaturalist. The species identification is not the only ecological question we could ask with that data, right? Um, what if we wanna know something about the behavior of alligator lizards? And that's something that's been very hard to study in the past. Well, potentially what you can do is if you can really efficiently adapt a representation to learn this novel task of, you know, you find me examples of alligator lizards mating is this alligator lizard mating or not, um, then we could start thinking about how to query these huge repositories of data to answer new ecological questions. Um, so what we looked at here was uh, self-supervised and fully supervised methods for extracting um, you know, really adaptable representations. Um, and finally, another really cool recent project coming from Grant Van Horn at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is looking at um, using odd, recognizing species in audio data. Um, here we're looking at uh, recognizing bird song in the wild. And Grant has done just a really spectacular job of deploying this in an app that's usable from your phone. So if you're in the US or Canada, you can, you can download this app for free. You can go outside, you can hold up your phone and it will take an audio recording and tell you in real time what birds are calling. Um, and that's a pretty spectacular uh, machine learning result, I'd say. Um, so there's a couple big open challenges um, that, you know, actually Dave talked about a few as well. Um, 
one of them is, you know, yeah, how do we make use of all of those different types of data we have access to? We currently train these models in, in these siloed systems. Um, but ideally, actually, we could share information across these different types of data. Um, one example of a project that's just starting to move in this direction is um, we've been looking at trying to build generalizable systems for urban forest monitoring um, with some colleagues at Google. And we put together a really large data set that should come out hopefully in the next few months. Um, it's around uh, it's 25 cities across the US and Canada, and you're able to then analyze whether your systems trained on large cities will generalize to small ones. Um, another thing is incorporating domain expertise into methods. There's so many things that we know about ecosystems and machine learning as a sort of a black box system tries to ignore those things. But if we really want to solve these problems, we shouldn't be leaving any information behind. Um, so one way we're looking at this right now is when we're trying to identify elephants, an expert understands something about the way that elephant social structures work. And then when they see a group of elephants, they're usually identifying elephants based on the context of the group. And so we're trying to give our machine learning models that same advantage. So we're using past observations to try to model the social network of elephants and then trying to build a social prior that will allow us to identify individuals more effectively. Um, and finally, I think it's very important when we're talking about doing this with impact as our goal. And the systems we build are both accessible and equitable. Um, and so really for me there, that, that means we cannot do parachute science. We can't as you know, people at very privileged institutions go collect data from you know, the sub-equatorial tropics, bring it back to our institution, build a machine learning benchmark data set, generate some method, report results and publish it at CVPR and then leave. <laughs> that, is, that is not the same as impactful biodiversity monitoring. Um, and so we really need to make sure that as we're designing these projects and we're taking these things on, that we have a clear, sustainable plan for how the methods we're developing are going to actually contribute back to on the ground biodiversity monitoring and the local communities who are benefiting from that biodiversity. Um, and another thing that actually we really move the needle on this is just making our models more efficient to train, more efficient to run inference on and, and more easily to access locally. Um, that network of camera traps that collected 10 million images for me, the only way I could get that data to the cloud was to ship it from Africa to California and upload it at Caltech because there just was not access to the type of bandwidth to get that data up to the cloud from, from a local, um, from anyone in Kenya, basically. <laughs> uh, so um, yeah, the more that we can make these methods efficient and essentially cost effective, the, the more accessible and the more usable they're going to be. Um, and then finally, we need to increase interdisciplinary capacity in this space. Um, there is way too much computer vision work that needs to be done than there are computer vision researchers who are working on these problems. And so from my perspective, I would really love to empower the ecological community to start answering their own questions with machine learning and computer vision. Um, so along those lines, uh, I think was mentioned before that I started this AI for Conservation Slack community. The goal there was to provide a common space where people could talk about challenges and best practices and share opportunities. Um, and so if you're interested in joining, just email us at AI for Conservation at gmail.com and we'll invite you to the Slack. We now have almost 700 researchers on there. Um, and then the other thing is I, I launched um, this summer school on computer vision methods for ecology. We'll have our first school this summer. Um, and the idea here is we've invited ecology graduate students and postdocs to propose their own computer vision research problem that will help them with their eco ecological research. So they're going to come with their own data and their own challenge, and we're going to train them in how to actually build a computer vision method and evaluate a computer vision method for their own research. Um, and I think that the more we can do that, we can actually shift the the data set curation and the applied machine learning into the ecological community so it's accessible and so they can iterate it on it um, in a domain aware way. And then we as a computer vision and machine learning community can continue to tackle what doesn't work with off the shelf methods. Cool, okay, I think that's all my slides. Um, I, I think we have quite a few questions, so um, thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah, for that fantastic talk. And I do think that we, we have a lot of questions, but also both of you have already answered quite a few of them in the course of your talks. So um, let's, let's see how many we can get through and let's try for brief answers since there are a lot of questions. Um, so uh, Dave, a question for you. 
to what extent can you use deforestation uh, deforestation analysis uh, with machine learning to uh, evaluate interventions? Uh, for example, if you were to remove a canal or a road, or if you are looking at reforestation models, where could one plant trees optimally to increase forest growth or increase biodiversity? Okay, uh, let me get the second part of that first, which is um, reforestation, afforestation, and growth. You can definitely, there's a project called Restore. That's restore.ego that, that we're working with. It's, um, that's their big focus. Uh, and the challenge is it, it takes a lot longer for a forest to grow than to knock it down. So uh, it takes longer to, to collect the data um, and analyze it, but that's one of their main focuses. Uh, and yeah, in terms of um, monitoring forests for uh, interventions, it's it's key. Um, and you know, you you can. Uh, there's a lot of work that that I'm involved with um, for trying to figure out like where to do specific interventions based on patterns of forest loss and um, and to yeah, like where to put. Um, overpasses for species to cross to minimize the amount of roadkill that occurs. There's work there that's happening. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities. Fantastic. Um, a question for Sarah. Um, I think particularly with regards to uh, iNaturalist or other citizen science data, uh, human bias is generally often a problem in machine learning. How do you account for human bias and try to minimize that when processing data? I assume this was referring to biases involved in, for example, misidentification of species, but it, it could also be referring to other biases. You, you talked about geographic biases. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, yeah, there's, there's, of course, different ways that bias can play a role in not just community science data, but actually any ecological data. Um, one way, of course, uh, is sampling bias, and iNaturalist data has a lot of that. Um, it's, you know, it's collected by humans, which means it's collected where humans go. Um, and frequently, you know, that's not necessarily representative of the overall ecosystem. There's also human bias in what we want to take pictures of. Um, there's, uh, there's, a huge, <laughs> there's a huge number of pictures of bald eagles on iNaturalist. Bald eagles are really not that common, but um, real, people get excited and want to upload iNaturalist observations of what they consider to be exciting species. And that means there's a huge bias taxonomically in iNaturalist as well. Um, and then finally, um, iNaturalist data is actually labeled by the community as well as collected by the community. And so for something to become research grade in iNaturalist, you basically have to have one person suggest an identification and at least one other person agree with that identification. This is also a fallible process. There are certain types of species that are very difficult to identify, um, even for experts. And, and, so, um, and then also we're a social species and there's confirmation bias that can occur. Um, because you can see what the first person put, if it's someone that you like or you think is cool, then maybe you might agree with them. Um, so I completely agree that there's a lot of different ways that something like citizen science data or community science data can, um, can incur biases. Um, I think that there's a couple different ways you can think about handling that. Um, one thing that's quite interesting um, that, that Grant Van Horn uh, looked at in, in the process of his PhD was actually, can you model um, how difficult a given image is based on the amount of agreement in the community? And can you also model how good a given person is at identifying um, a species? And, and you can do this on a one-to-one on a -one mapping, right? So if someone's never even tried to identify a species, you don't know anything about how good they are, um, but maybe they can start to build up a, a reputation in a given taxonomic group, which means that you should trust them more. And then you can actually jointly model all of this to try to understand what observations you should or should not trust. Um, and this, this is a process that can be used to curate clean training data sets for machine learning, as well as a process that you might be able to take to try to understand what data in iNaturalist is valuable. Um, but I think from an ecological perspective, this, answer, this brings up a lot of really interesting questions because you wanna use this data <laughs> as inputs into uh, existing ecological modeling, um, things like you know, species distribution models. You need to figure out how to account for all of those different biases, and that can be challenging. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that response, Sarah. I think we have to 
close out. So I'm going to end on a combo question, integrating a couple of, of different ones from, from the audience and from the pre-questions. Um, are there recommended APIs or data sets for people interested in training neural networks or playing with machine learning and conservation data? I know you've brought up a bunch, um, but are there any low-hanging fruit that you would recommend? And also, um, what institutions would you recommend to the audience for jobs or internships regarding research in this area? I'll let you both tackle that. On the data set side, lila.science is a really amazing sort of centralized repository for, um, for this type of biodiversity data. Um, and so there's a ton of, um, of awesome data sets that are sort of machine learning ready on there that are, that are good to play with. Um, also the Kaggle competitions as part of the fine-grained visual, um, fine visual categorization workshop that happens at CDPR every year and I'm co-organizing this year um, frequently have a natural world bent. So there will be, there are, you know, iNaturalist competitions, competitions at categorizing species in herbarium sheets and, uh, you know, species ID and camera traps and a bunch of other things. Um, and that's fun too, because if you win, you get to get a plaque and come to CDPR. <laughs> Yeah, um, and I'll add, um, let's see. So, so Earth Engine has a lot of uh, data sets that are environmental data sets. Um, Amazon also has their um, open data catalog and, I, and Microsoft is working on it. So those, those groups have large data sets that they're building um, on the data set side. Um, IUCN um, and uh, there's another group called the uh, UNEP WCMC, it's United Nations um, organization. They have lots of data. So look, look at IUCN site and, and WCMC in particular, UNEP WCMC. Um, and then a lot of the uh, conservation organizations are great places to do internships in this area. So WWF does work in it, Conservation International does, the Wildlife Conservation Service, there are lots of places like that. Um, and there are a number of um, really great academic institutions like that Sarah knows and um, uh, that do this work. Um, Wild Labs, so wildlabs.net is a great community to go to to find more of this research and another and a community of people doing it. Um, so I, that's I'll give one last pitch for uh, uh, wildlabs.net. I think that's a great place to go. There's also a conservation tech directory that's recently come out that has um, a list of all the research groups that are doing the stuff in this space. Um, and I will give the link to David so it can get sent out. And then about jobs, um, the Climate Change AI newsletter is great for this. Um, and then we also have a jobs channel on our Slack channel. So um, yeah, there's, there's lots of opportunities. Fantastic, thank you both. We are well and truly out of time, but thank you everyone for attending uh, either live here on, on YouTube. If you're looking for uh, recordings, there will be a recording on YouTube uh, on the Climate Change AI channel. Uh, huge thanks to both of our speakers. Thank you so much, Sarah and Dave. Uh, that was hugely instructive and really inspirational. I also want to call out Maara Kailamariam, uh, the webinars lead at Climate Change AI for organizing the entire webinars series for um, you know, this one and a, a, a bunch of others. Check out our upcoming webinars. We cycle through a lot of different topics uh, once every month. Um, that's all we have for you today um, and have a good weekend. Thanks everyone. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Thanks, Dave.